All right, well, our sermon today is entitled, Our Two Fathers. And you know what? I was going to have a little fun with it and call it My Two Dads. But um, then I was worried people wouldn't get the reference that 80s TV show with Paul Reiser. And they would instinct, instead think that I had lost my mind. So um, it looked a little too modern, so I thought uh, I would stick with Our Two Fathers. You know, sometimes today, Father's Day is referred to what they call a Hallmark holiday. And the idea being that the holiday was created more for commercial reasons than to commemorate some special or historical event. And you know what? I myself kind of think of it that way sometimes, just to be honest with you. But even if that's true, that doesn't mean that it isn't special. Because we've made it special, we've intended to, especially in the Christian community, look to the importance of fathers. And really, we should embrace opportunities to celebrate our parents. So what if Hallmark makes a few extra bucks? Let's honor our fathers today. Let's do, let's do so specially by looking at two fathers that all of us in the body of Christ share, God the Father and Abraham. Now, Abraham may not be our genetic father, maybe to some of you. Um, I've done that ancestry test. Uh, so Scotch, Irish, like 99%, something like that. So I don't think I share him as a genetic father, but maybe some of you do. But you know what? But more importantly, we take after him in faith. So we take after Abraham. And as our father Abraham showed us the way, we too may create a legacy of faith for our families and our communities. Now, our Lord Jesus tells us believers, us followers in him, to refer to God as our Father. We did it this morning in the Lord's Prayer. If we trust in Jesus alone for our salvation, then we can rightly approach our Holy Father because the righteousness of the Son has been placed on us. It's been imputed upon us through faith. And now we become children of God by following after the example of the other father we all share, Abraham. And I just want to be clear before I move on about something. Although the theme is going to be about fathers and about being an example to our children, the principles clearly can apply to mothers as well. So I've got to stick with the theme. It's Father's Day. But you mothers can go, well, okay, let's change the gender and you can still have it apply to you. Now, let's begin with our Genesis 17, 1 through 7. Now, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you. And you'll be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings will come forth from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your descendants after you, throughout their generations, for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. Now, I'm sure of you, many of you, remember that children's song, Father Abraham? Remember that song, Father Abraham? Now, how many of you remember it? Okay, good. Actually, we're singing it later. So, um, And if you get upset with that, Nancy was not here, and this is what happens when you leave music decisions to me. <laughs> so, <laughs> now, I have to apologize, praise team. But even though we're going to sing it later, I'm going to have to upstage you and remind people by singing some of the lyrics myself right now. So I'm sorry to upstage you, but I have no choice. Just sing the chorus. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, that was my debut, actually. So. Now, simple as it may be, that's actually a great song, isn't it? Just, I mean, it's such a straightforward message, and it's simple, but it's theologically dense. Because being a child of Abraham is indeed a great reason to praise the Lord. 
Now, it's a father's job to be an example to his children and to show them the way. If you had a good father growing up, then you know that you could trust in him to guide you. But even if you didn't, and I know that some didn't, maybe many here didn't, and I, I understand that, but you could all the more look to your fathers to show you the way, your two biblical fathers. Now here in our passage, God confirms the covenant with Abraham and then giving, or then giving Abram an enhanced name, Abraham. Now Abram means exalted father, while Abraham means father of a multitude or father of nations. Now the most obvious of these nations that we would think of when we think of nations came from him, several nations. Yes, of course, the Israelites, that's probably the most obvious in our mind through history today, mostly known today as the Jewish people. Now, they're the descendants of Jacob through Abraham's son Isaac, so it's through that lineage. Now, there are many modern-day Arabs who no doubt descend from Abraham's son Ishmael. There are, of course, the Edomites who descend from Abraham's grandson and Jacob's brother Esau. And what many miss is that Abraham had six sons with his final wife, Keturah. This is in Genesis 25. So he has a, another wife. It lists six sons. We don't know much about them. But I suspect many Arabs come from them as well. Those in the Middle East descend today. And we just don't know who they are. Also, Abraham no doubt had a multitude of daughters. We just don't know their names. Because for the sake of keeping biblical records, the writers for lineages would just list male names. Now, part of that is because people, men, are kind of reckless and get themselves killed in dumb ways. I don't know if some of you ladies know that. And, but people kind of knew who their mom was. It was a little easier to attach to who your mom is. So often for genealogical records, they would list the father. Now, all of these are children of Abraham who sort of take after him genetically. They descend from him. And there are different blessings to be had by Abraham's natural children. I mean, we see promises in the Bible to them, very definitely the Israelites, but also to Ishmael's descendants as well, because the Lord took compassion on him and on his mother. But all of these blessings, these blessings that come through this genetic line because of God's promises, they pale in comparison to what it means to be a spiritual child of Abraham. Now, being a spiritual child of Abraham is indeed more important than being a genetic one. Although I don't want to just diminish the importance of that. We, the Bible's clear on it. But this following after Abraham was really key to having salvation, trusting in the Lord like he did. Who remembers the second half of John, where it says some of the Jews who had believed on Jesus, they placed a little bit of faith in him, they hadn't been saved, but they're starting to lose their faith in him, and they sort of get an argument with Jesus. You know, you're never going to win a theology argument with the Messiah. It just never pans out. I've read the whole New Testament, by the way, and it never works. So they get in an argument with him. And I'm going to paraphrase it and matter of than paraphrase, just to give you the idea, so we don't have to go through it all. And they more or less say, don't you worry about us, our fathers, Abraham. So don't you, don't you be concerned about us. So Jesus says, uh, no, he isn't. Your father is the devil. So they go, what? How dare you say that? And he says, well, it's because you don't do what Abraham did. Abraham was not a liar or a murderer like you are. And Abraham trusted in me. Wow. So the idea is that to be a child of Abraham, according to Jesus, it's more important that you do what Abraham does rather than what your blood and your genetics are. Now, what does it take to become a spiritual child of Abraham? Let's again consult the scriptures. This is Galatians 3, 6 through 9. Even so, Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Therefore, be sure that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. The scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, All the nations will be blessed in you, so that those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham, the believer. Now, Paul begins this passage with arguably his favorite verse from the Old Testament. I suspect it is. 
Genesis 15, 6. Now, in Romans 4, 3 and here, the apostle uses this verse as the cornerstone of his argument on being saved. And that verse says, Then he, Abraham, believed in the Lord, believed in Yahweh, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. Now, if you remember the background of Genesis 15, 6, back in, well, actually back in 12, Abram is promised as many stars, he's, he's promised nations, as many descendants as are stars and sand. And then he's getting older. You know, he's 75, his wife is definitely past the age of childbirth. And the Lord appears to Abraham, still Abram there, you know, a little anachronism. And he says, and you know, Abram's a little concerned. He says to the Lord, you know, um, you promised me all these descendants. I'm getting a little nervous here. And I, am I going to have to make Eleazar, which is a distant relation, my heir? Is that what you're going to want? And the Lord goes, no, but I shall give you a legitimate heir, your seed. And then he again promises them all these descendants and nations that would come through him. And then instead of Abraham saying, how, which I think is the default of even a lot of faithful people, can you explain to me how you're going to do it? Instead of doing that in that moment, Abraham just believes in the Lord at that moment. And it's credited to him as righteousness. So he is saved because he placed all his trust in what God had said and who God was. The nature of God to bring about what now started to seem impossible. So he's declared righteous because he trusts in the Lord. Simple as that. And so those who now place their trust in the Lord Jesus take after him in spirit. He is their father by example. So if you're a believer in the Lord of Jesus, you're a child of Abraham. This is the Genesis 12 promise revealed that all nations would be blessed by having salvation through faith in Messiah Jesus. Because remember, he's saying in Genesis 12, one of the great covenant promises, the Abrahamic covenant, all the nations will be blessed through you. And now we see today, all nations on earth, all ethnicities have people in them that trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. They have eternal life. They know the Lord. So they have been blessed through the promise given to Abraham because his descendant is Jesus. And it's also who Abraham trusted. So there's this wonderful symmetry to these promises and how they come about prophetically. Remember the covenant promise we read about earlier in Genesis 17 about Cain's descending from Abraham? Well, combine that with the covenant promises that all nations have been blessed through Abraham. And then we come to this. Galatians 3.29. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. And Jesus Christ is one of those kings promised to Abraham. Indeed, he is the king of kings. And as Abraham's physical descendant, so he is the child of Abraham physically, we too become descendants to Abraham through our direct connection to Jesus because we are bound to him through faith and his blood covers us. There's nothing more powerful than the blood of Christ. And so we are bound to him. And thus, we now descend from Abraham in a way that matters far more than necessarily having some Semitic or Mesopotamian DNA. <laughs> we are heirs to the great promise, eternity with our Lord in his kingdom. And we can talk about covenant promises all day. If you come to my Tuesday night group, you probably like, he's telling the truth. But the ultimate promise is eternity with the Lord. That's where we really see the covenants manifest, to be with him and his rule. And indeed, even in the current age, while we await to be having the resurrection of the flesh and the return of Jesus, if we were to depart now, before that happens, as most believers have, simply in virtue of long history, we would go to a place, a paradise realm, where we would await the resurrection. But we would be with the Lord even then, while we awaited his return, and that place is called Abraham's bosom. It's called that by Jesus himself. So it's very, it's actually very hard for me to overestimate Abraham's importance, especially as a man, which he is. He is simply a man, but he is great because of his faith. You can be too. Now God being called our father and Abraham being called our father, that places a great responsibility 
on we Christian fathers. And like I said, this principle applies to mothers as well. We are called like Abraham was to be an example to our children, to model a Christ-like life for them and to show them with our own faith the way to salvation. We must point our children to Jesus and the salvation that is to be found through faith in him. And that is our great duty. Now, you fathers who are part of a legacy, a chain of faith, don't you dare be the weak link. You may have had many generations where you could say, my great, great, great grandfather found in such and such church in an important city, and we've just been believers in Jesus all this time. But I must tell you, I've met people like that who place their trust in that legacy of faith and then not continuing it and not teaching and raising up their kids. They trust in a legacy of sort of a genetics that some of the Jewish people in John 8 did. Said, don't worry about us. Look at our great, great granddad. Well, we have to continue that line of faith. That is our responsibility as Christian fathers. So don't be the weak link. Now, maybe some of you are first generation Christian fathers. And you know what? In that case, you have a wonderful opportunity to begin a new legacy of faith. Don't look at it, at it as, well, I didn't have all this sort of a foundation to build on, so it's harder for me. That's true. But you know what? You have an opportunity to be that one that started it. You could be a great patriarch of faith for whatever generations may come until our Lord returns. Now, maybe you don't have children. Well, some of you may have adopted children. Some of you may know people who have adopted children. And some of you still could. And adoption, I find, makes you so much more like God, your father. For, as we read in Ephesians 1.5, he predestined us as a, through adoption to become sons of Jesus Christ himself, according to the kind intention of his will. So the Lord himself took us, children of Adam, through his Holy Spirit and faith in Jesus caused us to be born again, to become adopted children through his son, Jesus Christ, his only begotten son. And so we too, and by the way, let me ask you a question. If you know someone who has adopted, do those people love their adopted children less than their genetic children? No. So they don't. They love their adopted children as much. And so we have that great assurance with God our Father. But did you also know, if you think, well, you know, I'm a little older here to adopt. Well, you can adopt, so to speak, by mentoring others. You could be a spiritual father or mother to others who are young in the faith and could use some uplifting. And you know what? It's a rare person that is so advanced in his or her faith that couldn't use a little mentoring. I'm happy to take some uh, older Christians' advice and guidance. Absolutely thrilled to do so because it's always helpful to have people helping raise you up as a father or motherly figure. Now, maybe you are a father who hasn't been discipling your children well or much at all so far. And there's just me even mentioning some of these things causes you a little guilt. In that case, start now. Just start now. Look into how you can disciple your children better now and just do your best now. Get advice. But start. I mean, that's really the most important thing. Start. Encourage them in their walk with Jesus. Study the Bible with them. Pray with them. Be an example of a godly man with them. And if you need an example on how to be a good father, then look to your fathers, Father God and Father Abraham. Now, if you please, pray with me. Lord, Father in heaven, thank you for your blessed son, Jesus Christ, that whose blood we are able to come to you now. Through faith in him, we are able to associate with the great man of faith, Abraham. We are able to be counted children of his. So, Lord, we would ask that you would especially bless us and help build us up because we come to you as our father, our, our Abba, and we speak to you with expectancy. And we ask that you would please build us up in the faith and use us well. Draw us in intimately with you, Lord. Allow us to feel your presence in our life. 
Lord, thank you for allowing you, the holy God of the universe, who cannot abide sin. Thank you for providing a way that we sinners, we children of Adam, may come to you renewed and become and made children of God through what your Son, Jesus Christ, has done. Your only begotten Son, he who is the mirror image of you and who you loved, but you sent to die on the cross for us. And Lord, thank you again for the paragon of faith, Abraham, who mirrored you because he also was at least willing to sacrifice his son. So Lord, we thank you for his example. We thank you most of all for the blood of your son, Jesus Christ. And we are so eternally grateful that you have given each of us two fathers that we may look forward to. Please help our fathers here to reach toward that example of Abraham and to create and maintain a legacy of faith. And these things we praise and ask in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.